Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to this morning's uh, Signpost webinar. I hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson, and I'm manager of the Chagas Connected Programme. This series is being brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, at the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And today we'll be talking about hedgerows. And I'm delighted uh, to be joined by Minister of State for Agriculture, Pippa Hackett, who has responsibility for land use and biodiversity. Minister, you're very, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It's uh, great to be here. I'm delighted that you're having a week of hedgerow discussions. And um, look, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you cover. And um, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to open it. So thank you. Great, delighted to have you. Um, also, we're joined by Dr. Ke Catherine Keena, uh, who is our Chagas Countryside Management Specialist. Catherine, you're welcome. Good morning, everybody. And also we're joined by Pat Murphy, uh, who is head of the Chagas Knowledge Transfer uh, Programme, uh, Environment Knowledge Transfer Programme. Pat, good morning to you. Good morning. Great. So, uh, Minister, um, thank you for agreeing to uh, launch Hedgerow Week for us. Um, we're, we're obviously hedgerows are an important part of uh, the, the landscape in Ireland. And um, in Chagask, we're developing programs as, and training to, to support farmers and uh, I suppose the, the wider community in protecting hedgerows. From your perspective, Minister, uh, how important are hedgerows as part of the uh, the, the work you're doing in the Depart Department of Agriculture? Um, look, I, I think hedgerows are really important. And, I, you know, when you look at the sort of fabric and the, the design of Irish countryside, it is really the, the hedgerows that give us that patchwork uh, appearance that we, we uh, that makes us quite unique in that regard, that we have small, relatively small holdings that are, you know, divided up with hedges. And, and the age range in a hedge is quite, uh, can be quite, quite remarkable um they say if you have a mature hedge and if you you know if you pace something like 30 meters and count the species in that uh, for every species there the hedge potentially might be 100 years old for each species uh, i'm talking about a mature hedge not obviously one that's you know re planted recently but it might be worthwhile farmers even doing that if they have you know hedges that they know have been there for generations you know pace along the hedge for 30 meters and how many different species of plants are there and that gives you an indication of how old and how long that hedge has been there but i think you know there's the there's also you know besides the sort of cultural significance of hedges the, the biodiversity support that hedges provide are huge and um, you know maybe in times past we've farmers and you know we've seen hedges as as you know dividing fields um, but the, the support that they can provide is vast and I, you know we're, we're becoming more and more aware of that the importance of that and you know how we manage the hedges obviously del will deliver for for biodiversity um, so I think I think that's really you know for example like most hedge grow species you know they mightn't blossom or fruit it'll be a second year's growth that potentially that will happen so I mean if you're cutting your hedges annually you're probably unlikely to have any blossom or, or fruit you know so you, you that you, we do talk about different ways of cutting hedges and maybe we're getting into a situation now where less is more yes yes. Oh, well, look, that's uh, something Catherine will be talking about uh, today and also next week as well. But in terms of the, the, the programme for government minister, what are the priorities in relation to uh, biodiversity and, and how do you see these being incorporated into the next common agricultural policy in, in that, well, the, the strategy that we have to develop within Ireland? Um, I think I think in the current program for government, I think biodiversity gets a mention about fifty times. So um, <laughs> compared with previous programs for governments, there's you know there's been a distinct shift in in how we value biodiversity. Look, our own uh, government has declared a climate and biodiversity emergency, and really you know I think farmers have the have, have the greatest potential to deliver potentially for both of those issues. And I think that has to be embraced as an opportunity for Irish farmers. And I you know I've 
total faith that we can we can do it and with the work that you know Chagas are doing I think it's really something to aim for not to be seen as a, as a challenge but as an opportunity but I mean within the program for government I mean there are a lot of I mean the priorities for biodiversity I suppose we don't have a real measure of what, where we are at with farm biodiversity so a lot of the commitments are around assessing um, where biodiversity is at on farms so we want to measure uh, do a hedgerow survey we want to carry out baseline biodiversity surveys on farms so we so we know where we're starting from because ultimately um, if we want to improve it we need to be able to measure that improvement so I think that's important but I mean we're also looking at aspects such as maybe soil biodiversity and we forget that you know actually most of the biodiversity we have is below our feet and the value of soils I mean I think tomorrow is soil World Soil Day or National Soil Day, um, I think the value of soil biodiversity often gets um, forgotten about also. So look, it's huge. The scope is huge there. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it implemented, a lot of these measures. No, I, I agree with you. The soil is often the, the out of sight, uh, out of mind uh, part of the, the, the landscape. Uh, in, in Ireland, as you know, we have a considerable, air, considerable areas of land that are farmed intensively. Uh, can we do more to value these farming systems and uh, further improve their environmental con contribution or, uh, you know, do or, you know, does a view some people say, well, look, we'll int farm intensively in, in those areas and let those areas be almost a sacrifice for, 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 for biodiversity. Um, that's a minority view, I, I suspect, but uh, it just, yeah. just uh, to, to, uh, to put that to you. No, it, it, it is an interesting perspective because, um, you know, we talk about this room for nature and, you know, you could maybe have that, um, you know, areas that are intensively managed and then, you know, other areas that aren't so. But I, I, I think it is a minority view. I think ultimately, if we want biodiversity to work across our country, we need you know, every piece of the land delivering in some way for that or doing its best to do that. So, I mean, I think we on the whole, like, unfortunately, we're still pretty much in a situation where um, our human actions in Ireland even are not delivering you know, enough for, for biodiversity, for water quality, for air quality, for emissions. So we're, we're still on the sort of slightly downward trajectory of that. And we really need to try and certainly stabilize and move it upwards. But I mean, you have examples of intensive farms that are working well for biodiversity, even the, the Bride project, the EIP project in, in East Cork. You know, we have intensive dairy farmers there and they're all working collectively together in a region to, to do to, to support biodiversity. And I think there's certainly potential in those models to expand that. Um, I mean, we do have the strategies from the EU that want us to use less pesticides, less fertilizer and all that. And I think if we can embrace that, and I know I know Chagas do work in, in this in terms of having, having to, you know, trying to reduce our, say, fertilizer use and, and dependency. Um, and I think that, you know, all of that needs to come together. And I think working with farmers as we design those, maybe different ways of farming will be all important as well you know we, we can have the best ideas but if, if it's not implemented on the ground or farmers don't want to do them they're not really worth the paper they're written on so it's important to get that buy-in are there any particular measures that you'd like to see in any future uh, agri-environmental schemes um i think i mean i i think any agri-environmental scheme um look i mean ultimately i suppose the purpose of them not only you know, besides providing, if you like, farmers with a, an additional income, um, they have to deliver for nature and they, you know, they have to ultimately deliver for, for, for biodiversity and the environment. Um, I think environmental schemes should be simple. They, should, they shouldn't be seen as, 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 as a, a burden. And I think the simpler they can be made, the better. And look, we're, we're talking about hedgerows even this week. I mean, even a, a mechanism to, to enhance the hedges, to, to manage them in a different way, you know, that could be a very simple measure. It would probably save farmers money. Um, maybe certain sectors mightn't be too enthralled with that. They might see it as a, a threat to their own, um, you know, incomes. But I think if we carefully manage hedgerows. I think there should be scope in there. Um, I mean, that's just one idea. But I think, I think whatever schemes we come up with, um, they are going to move towards that sort of results based. So we have delivered, we pay on their delivery and um, they have to be simple. They have to be non-burdensome, and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. um, just minister, in relation to um, you know educating and informing farmers about 
uh, the best practice in relation to hedgerow quality. Uh, how how do you think we should we should go about doing that or improving the the, the, the awareness? Yeah, well, I mean, actually, in budget 2021, we, we did secure funding for, for biodiversity training for, for on, on farms, um, so I, um, for farmers. So I think there's an awareness element there that we need to share. I think, I think that peer-to-peer -peer thing is nearly the best way to do it between farmers. Um, I think they probably learn best in that regard. I mean, I know I do talking to farmers, you, you get little nuggets here and there, and oh, I'll try that. Um, so I think that's important. And I think I think even simple things, like, you know, I look, I, I enjoy biodiversity, enjoy like bird species, but I, I don't know every bird species. I don't know what they sound like. And I, I wouldn't necessarily identify them all. So, I mean, I, I want to be educated myself on my own farm to be able to identify biodiversity when I see it, plant species, different types of species in the hedge uh, and what, what, what they can deliver. And I think that that's all part of that knowledge and that education and that awareness of the value of biodiversity. And of course, biodiversity delivers Besides that, it provides pollinators for crops. You know, if we don't have biodiversity, we don't have the pollinators, we mightn't get the crops um, pollinated. So it, it, there's a direct impact on, on how we farm. And I, again, going back to, I suppose, the biodiversity in soils, if we get that piece right and we build organic matter in soils and we have a really functioning soil um, that might not need as much fertilizer to, to, to perform. And I think they're all things we should be looking at moving towards um, and, and, and sharing that knowledge. And look, there's farmers doing all sorts of things across the country, um, trialing things themselves, different ways of farming, different, you know, delivering different um, you know, grass types and mixed species swords and all sorts of elements there that we can share that knowledge, you know, learn from it and understand the science behind it, of course, and, and, and move on from there. You mentioned that the that biodiversity training budget. Would you, do you see any potential for expanding that to to other areas, or indeed expanding the overall budget to a wider wider audience? Um, hopefully, I mean, I think we were hopefully thinking it might um, it might train in the region of fifty thousand farmers when when it's rolled out. Now, look, it's at the early stages. We haven't even devised how it might, but it is for next year. So you know, it's going to have to be you know taken off the ground and, and delivered. But um, I think. Um, I think again, it'll inform us moving forwards. We are in this transition period before we, you know, we've the fully sort of funded cap round again. So I think there's scope now in the next two years to trial things, see how they work best. I think ultimately something on biodiversity really has to be delivered on farm. You have to sort of get into, you know, you have to be there, I think, to deliver it. And hopefully when, when COVID <laughs> moves away as swiftly as possible, we'll be able to get back to more sort of on farm um, visits, and I think that would be important. Yeah, uh, Minister, there's many uh, farmers out there um, wondering about the the next agri environmental scheme, and I know there has been uh, discussion about an interim scheme or a, a scheme to to bridge that gap between the the, the, the two uh, caps. Uh, is there any developments on that side of of things? Um, well, look, that, that, that's obviously going to have to be ready for next year very soon as well. And look at the department, we are working on that. I mean, we have, I, I think at this stage, it's going to be, because it is a pilot scheme, we want to essentially trial as many possible options as possible within that and, and learn from it over the next couple of years as to which works best and how farmers found them. So, I mean, look, that work is ongoing. And look, I'd expect, you know, some sort of announcement, you know, shortly in terms of how and when and why. Um, but again, it's about, I suppose, farmer engagement. And we are certainly moving towards that sort of results-based payment model. And I think that's, um, it's worth keeping that in mind, I think, moving forward, because the, the, there's scope there to, you know, for some farmers to maybe do really well quite soon in, in, in that situation. And maybe other farmers maybe have to wait a bit longer because they, they're not quite to the, the level. I mean, up to now we've had action-based schemes where you get paid um, upfront, which is fine, or, or you know you get paid for doing an action um, and there hasn't really been a measure of the, the results, say in the glass scheme and so forth. But I mean, we do have these 23 EIP style um, locally led schemes, which seem to very much a results based. So you have your bribe project, you've got your pearl muscle project, your hen harrier. So I think that I think that regionalization and localization of environmental schemes is mm -hmm. really important. And look, they're a little bit more difficult maybe to design, but I think when you get that farmer buy-in and it's grassroots led and farmers come together essentially to decide how it will work, 
I think that's really, really important and that's really empowering for farmers and they, they're, they're in it together. I think that's really, that's vital. I know there's um, a lot of um, respect at a EU level for the work that's happening in Ireland actually in relation to EIPs yes. and how they are almost a test bed for future schemes. Um, we have a question, Minister, in relation to the issue uh, relating to the habitat destruction of this ineligible areas. Uh, you, you're a farmer, Minister, you understand the, how the, the BPS operates and yeah. uh, you know the, how, how farmers are being penalised effectively for uh, retaining habitat, as, as some people describe it. Uh, has there been any progress on that area? Because I know it is a, an area of deep frustration for, for the whole farming community. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's great that it is a frustrating area because I think that gives us powers and, and it, it, it gives it pushes us as, as you know, ministers in agriculture and, and the government to do to keep looking at that. So I mean, certainly my my own department are looking at those eligibility rules um, and ultimately, you know, land should be eligible when it's delivering for the objectives of the cap and the cap the objectives are, are evolving, you know, you know, um, after each round of the cap, they are evolving, and and and, and, li and likewise, in parallel, the eligibility rules should evolve, and they yeah. they they sort of haven't evolved, whereas the the objectives of the cap have. So it's certainly something I'm very much interested in in, in getting sorted out because it's very difficult to deliver on one hand for for biodiversity when you're restricted on the other by your eligibility of your your land. So look, I. I I'll be all over it anyway. I'll do what I can to, to make sure that that is uh, that's rectified. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, one, one final question, if if I may, uh, we had just a question in relation to agroforestry and and the future role that that has to play in the Irish landscape. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion around it, um, but do you see any any uh, schemes or programs coming forward to to support or to 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 encourage uh, that uh, within Ireland? Um, I think so. I think, you know, we're, 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 we've really very little land in agroforestry. And I think it's really, uh, it's, in a way, it's a win-win for, for farmers who, there's always this sort of forestry or farming thing. And look, agroforestry does, the, does both. And there's co-benefits, it seems, from the research I've read, not only for the, the, the trees, also for the land in which the, the, and even if there's animals within that land, um, the benefits are there. I, I hope to look where again, forestry is almost aligned. The forestry program is aligned almost with the cap, even though it's all exchequer funded. Um, so we are, we'll, we'll have this transition period as well, but I think there is scope to, to open up um, more agroforestry supports. And um, again, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in pushing for that and delivering for that. Look, forestry is, in, is still in, in, in somewhat of a crisis at the moment in terms of um, you know timber supply um, we are working incredibly hard to, to you know to change that and there are some you know there have been signs of improvements in the last sort of couple of months um, we're still not there but um, look hopefully that will continue that improvement and we'll be in a you know in a couple of months we'll be in a better place that's but agroforestry certainly I think it'd be great I'd love to see way more agroforestry and I think it's something I think farmers would embrace because they can continue to farm and they get supported for for growing for growing trees and, and storing carbon so great win-win. Minister, uh, thank you very much for your time this morning and uh, for officially launching Hedgerow Week for us and uh, hope to, that maybe you can enjoy some of the, uh, the, the publications and the, um, the videos next week. Uh, we have some excellent, excellent speakers along the way, the way. and I uh, want to wish you well and uh, if it's not too early, wish you and your team a happy Christmas <laughs> and um, thank you. we, we thank maybe... You. Uh, Hope to have you back again at some stage. Uh, we're, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and look forward to getting down to Athen Rye someday, see all those sheep. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd, we're delighted to welcome you down. Thank you. Take care. Okay. All the best. Thank you very have much. Take care. All the best. Thank you. So, Catherine, uh, we're, we're going to go back to, to you now. Uh, Catherine, uh, you're going to uh, provide us with a presentation on what's in store for us with Hedgerow Week next week. You have a You've been working hard on this, Catherine, for the last uh, few months. Uh, yes. Shall I share the screen, Mark? You can indeed, yes. Yeah. yeah. Am I there? Am I there? Well, I just go back to your first slide. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is the 
the second slide showing Mark how, how do um, you you're on this you just need to go up to display settings there Catherine and just change that to uh to show this, the full slide because we can see presenter mode here yeah um, hide presenter view uh yeah that should do it yeah okay. yes it's perfect okay. okay Catherine thanks for that and um Please, if you have questions, um, uh, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'd be delighted to, to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So Catherine, over to you. Okay, so thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thank you to Minister Hackett for, for launching Hedgerow Week. I, today, we're going to focus on growing hedges for a sustainable future. And all the presentations during the week are explaining the values of hedges as to why we should grow more um, starting with on on Monday we're given the background to the level of hedgerows the history the heritage uh, Tuesday we're moving on to the biodiversity the birds bats bees plants Wednesday we're talking about the other values um, the carbon the water the food from hedges and then we move into three days of management planting new hedges a, a routine hedge cutting, which was touched on a while ago there by the minister, and rejuvenating. So we shall perhaps go into some of them more uh, after, Mark, but I shall concentrate first on a few slides on growing new hedges. Great. So why I, we had a webinar earlier and was covered. this was covered in more detail. So I, we just, again, to, to, to reiterate, the biodiversity in hedgerows is fantastic. Um, the birds, maybe 55 of our birds use hedges, our mammals use hedges, all of our nine bat species use them particularly for corridors, but also for feeding and roosting if they're suitable. Uh, our bees need flowers and flowers can be in hedges, our solitary bumble and honeybee. Uh, the moths uh, come out at night and they use the hedgerows and similarly with the butterflies and the plants. Um, Dr. John Feehan told us during the week about about 100 plant species associated with hedges. So um, they are just, you know, a, a, high, a, a hive of biodiversity. The other um, topics that will be touched on during the week is the carbon and what we're doing to get more information on that. Uh, we have a lovely uh, topic on food from hedges. Uh, foraging for food is a is a, becoming more, you know, of, of interest to more people. Um, how hedges protect water quality, uh, which is again a major part of our work at the moment. And then farmers always appreciate hedges for shelter. So lots of reasons why to plant. So then I shall move on to um, how how we do it. And the first most important uh, conversation to have. And I think this is the mo most misunderstood um, topic. So I just want to explain about the two types of hedges that we have. Um, and before you plant, you must decide which you are going for. Both are good. I'd love to have both on every farm. And uh, there's a place for both. But just to put it very simply, now there's a wide range of hedges um, you could come up with 10 different, you know, ranges, but they basically fall into topped and untopped. So the topped would be the traditional hedge. Um, you know, what, what is a hedge? A hedge is, is, is a man-made artificial habitat. Uh, at the hedge, as we know what a hedge is, with a dense space, a managed hedge, okay? And that, this one has got a bad name because management can be very bad, but it can be very good. So, and I would, you know, I strongly argue that this provided, if this is what you want, um, there is a place for it done right and uh, will always need management, okay? The untapped hedge then, some people would even say it's not a hedge. I would absolutely want to keep it in the broad um, hedgerow family because it, it originated as a hedge, but it's, escaped from management, has become a line of trees. Some people call it linear woodland. Um, if the space at the base, it can be outgrowths and it can be practically a woodland. But it, so it is a, 
you can see clearly topped and untopped, I think I, I'm nearly coming down to being the simplest way of explaining. So when you, before you plant, you must decide which you're aiming for. And as I said, both are good. So to understand, we need to understand for both of these and how trees and shrubs grow. And this, what we call apical dominance. So you see the little uh, sapling on the left-hand side. Now that can be an oak tree or it can be a white thorn, um, but both of those have apical dominance. So in other words, they want to grow up into being a tree. And they, you can see the picture there, that's a 10 year old hedge, um, one that we actually coppiced during the week um, in, in, with, in Clannacilty, in Javis the Agricultural College. Um, where it has got stalky at the base and the, the preference for that particular hedge was to bring it back to being a, a dense base and, and managed correctly. So, and then the picture on the bottom is where, again, that sapling has never been topped and eventually its pur whole purpose in life is to go into being a white thorn tree with a single stem and a, a mature, you know, a, a, a canopy, um, and, and that is what you will end up with. Beautiful, um, beautiful top, uh, may not be so good at the base, um, you know, for, for some of the, 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 uh, the, the birds to nest, like the first picture I showed. So both have different advantages and both can be good, but it's really important when you have a hedge, both the existing ones um, and the newly planted ones, and this is where it has all gone wrong because people have failed to understand um, the difference between the two hedges. And the principle is that wherever you cut a tree, because we're talking, they're all trees, you know, trees, shrubs, people get mixed up again. Wherever you cut, um, the new shoots will grow immediately below the cut. And um, so you can see on the top there, when you cut it, one becomes probably five, it's just shown as two in that. Um, and then when you cut again, uh, the, 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 from a cutting point of view, this diagram has come from our routine cutting uh, leaflets, which has been around about 20 years, to explain that when you go back to cut, you always come a wee bit above the previous cut, and then each of them multiplies. So that diagram was specifically for cutting. Um, you can see the example on the bottom of the screen, um, where the hedge was cut at whatever, um, you know, three, four foot high and pulled all the growth up to that point and has turned into a row of, of um, you know, stalks with bushes on the top and um, what we call toilet brush hedges. And you can see there where the line is going back each year down to the same level. Um, and that's that's an extreme. Well, that's a very good picture, I suppose, to show it. But that, in effect, is what a lot of our hedges are, our older hedges are, are. Now, in summer, everything looks good. So it's only from now at this time of the year when you look down and see where the growth is, because don't forget, most of our hedges, as we'll explain um, again, John Feehan talks about the history of hedges and most of our hedges were planted apart from our townland boundaries, which date before the 17th century. Uh, most of our hedges belong about 200 years ago. Um, and what happened was when machines became available 40, 50 years ago, um, strong enough to cut them mechanically, they were cut at that four, four foot high and, um, and has pulled all the growth up to that level. Whereas again, um, the, we have a fantastic video and um, documents from uh, the Hedging Association of Ireland, Owen Donnelly, uh, where he has coppiced a hedge and again, always, 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 if you're bringing down the height, you go to the base um, rather than what's in that picture there. So that's really important. And you can see the picture on the top on the right hand side would be the ash tree, very typical in our hedges where that would have been a tall tree and where it's cut, then it's it and it, it, the growth appears then about the three foot high and it clearly it explains why ash there is not a good um, species to be cut in a hedgerow um, when you have, and we come on to those species again, but just remember that ash one there. Um, okay, so having decided, am I going to have a line of trees or am I going to have a hedge, a, a, a topped hedge? And as I said, both are good. I love both. We should have both on every farm. But then we talk about the, the species. 
Um, so the hedging species that can belong in either of those two hedges um, are, and the backbone of all our hedges is the thorns, black thorn and white thorn in particular, and fabulous holly in some parts of the country more than others, a fantastic um, hedging species, very slow growing. So our thorns are, will be always the basis of our farm hedge, hedge, hedges. Um, but the species that can go into that topped hedge are the untopped hedge um, because they tolerate topping. Um, they may not be just quite as, as uh, the, 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 the thorny ones, uh, uh, but they will definitely tolerate to topping and can live within that uh, the, the managed hedge situation are the spindle, the gelder rose, the hazel, and then the, the ones at the bottom there, the dog rose, both the flowers and the rose hips and the woodbine, um, they're, they're climbers, so they're, they may not be, um, they're not trees, but they're the climbers that belong in the hedge. So they're the species I would suggest for all hedges, but predominantly um, uh, white thorn, probably, so white thorn or black thorn. Okay, so, so they're safe. Um, and just one word of warning there to be careful, we'll talk about provenance in a minute, but even the species, um, the dog rose uh, that we have, you know, I, again, I'm not going all Latin here, but uh, Rosa, uh, Rosa Canina, and then there's another one that's sold regularly, and it's a really invasive one that should not, not be planted out on farms, um, uh, Rosa Rugosa. So just be very careful when we really want to plant um, native uh, species, and as I said, we'll touch on provenance in a moment. Now, the second lot, we only have about 20 native um, species in uh, tree species, and some of them are, you know, multiples of different types of willows, and, uh, you know, that we have two birches, and, and so the, there really isn't that many. We all, farmers and advisors, um, it's really easy to get to know um, our species once we just stick to our native ones. Don't start looking in, don't start learning in a place like um, a, a town or, or a, a Chagas Kildalta where you'd have planted, you know, ornamental species that really can confuse you. So we only want our natives out on the land. So then the trees that we're, we're talking about, the ash, the oak, um, the willow, the, the willow or sally, the aspen, they would be, the aspen is one of our, a popular, one of our native um, popular. So they'd be kind of the bigger trees. Then we have the alder, the rowan or mountain ash, the birch, the cherry, the crab apple, the white beam, all fantastic trees. The problem is if they're put into a hedge and topped, they both destroy the hedge, you would either have a hedge nor a tree. So, and that's what has, ha has happened in the past. And um, people love the idea, get, have bought the idea of having lots of species, put in lots of species and um, manage it in the wrong way. Uh, so these either, if, if, you were, if we're planting a hedge that is never going to be topped, we can put every species we like into it, all of these and the, the other ones. Um, if we put these into a topped hedge, we must retain them as individuals. So in other words, if, we're, if we really want to maintain that hedge as a topped hedge, we don't want um, too many trees in it because trees, will, will, trees are actually bad for the hedge, but they're good for obviously other things. Um, personally, I, I think a lot of the trees, we could put the, tree, the trees like these in field corners, um, groves of trees would be fantastic. Again, there's no reason why every native tree wouldn't be on every farm. Now, obviously taking into account that some are more appropriate um, in the area and the soil, etc. But there's no harm in trying to have the 20 trees are, are on your farm. But perhaps these could belong in, in tree in field corners. Um, so they they can go, they can all go into the untopped hedge. If if they go into the top hedge, um, not too many. And number two, the reason I think the gloss went for the very simple um, of literally white thorn, black thorn, holly. And I actually liked that idea. It was very simple and there was still room for trees. And where, where people in the past, where people have planted trees, ash would be the most popular, good for firewood, fantastic. But where we have um, both in our routinely cut hedges and our newly planted hedges, people, Farmers and contractors tend to leave ash, leave these trees, 
at the expense of leaving the thorns. And the thorns are particularly valuable for the flowers for the bees. Now you can see there the cherry and the crab apple, some of those, they all flower obviously, but some are, are, are more um, a different in a different way, but the thorns are particularly important. The white thorn for the bees in Ireland is absolutely critical. Um, I mean, we, we don't need to be talking about uh, uh, planting new flowers. We just need to manage the flowers that we have on the farm. Um, and the white thorn would be the huge one there. Um, so yeah, so that's my point about the trees. So make sure to, if you have 100 meters of a hedge and you decide if you're planting a, topped, a hedge that's going to be topped and managed as a dense base, um, you might want five or six trees in it. You must leave the thorns before you even think of planting these ones. OK, um, and if you run out of space, then put the trees in the corner. Just to be very clear, the ones we don't want, we don't want ornamental species. Uh, we, from a biodiversity point of view, we don't want the introduced species, the chestnut, sycamore and beech would be the ones that kind of confuse us. They have been here about 200 years as opposed to the 10,000 years of our native species. Not as good to support wildlife and, <clears throat> and not recommended from a biodiversity point of view. Native provenance. What this means is the species we talked about um, have been here for 10,000 years. The provenance means that the, it, the seed, the plant is, is grown from a seed that came from an Irish tree um, or an Irish flower. So the seed it, it comes, the seed has also been here for 10,000 years as opposed to being imported. Um, so the species can be um, native, but the provenance may not be. And this sadly has been the case for a lot of what we have planted. And we've struggled with this issue um, back 25 years, I started writing about please plant native provenance. Um, it doesn't always happen, uh, but it is best for biodiversity. Um, it would be fantastic. I think now is an opportunity um, to, to seriously think about this, how we can support it. Um, Donal Flanagan is our, our Chagas um, nursery stock advisor. He works with the young tree production sector and um, they have really um, modernized in the last 10 years and are, are well fit to compete uh, with our, our European counterparts. I think what we need is a lot of clarity and um, support, you know, to, to be very clear what we want out of them. Now, the Chagas Horticulture, um, our Chagas Horticulture Advisory um, Unit, have have stakeholders with the nursery stock sector in general and they are going to talk in particular to the young tree production sector in other words the people who are growing um growing uh plants for for sale and i'm going to work with donal and it would be lovely if we could we need a, a run-in period um we need three years to, to collect the seed sow the plants and use them for growing in Ireland. But <clears throat> it obviously is the way to go forward. And now there are people doing that, but and I think we need to support them and clear, be clear that how much better that is than um, from a biodiversity point of view than, from, than bringing in plants which are grown um, outside Ireland from seed, again, from outside, grown outside Ireland and grown from seed that comes from outside Ireland. Okay. Um, so just move on to the planting, um, how to plant. Again, we've, we've, this one has been covered very much over the years. And for, for this particular week, we went to, to Galway to um, Henry and Patricia and Enda Walsh, who are far, a dairy farmer in derogation near Oran Moor, who has decided to plant a new hedge for the first time. Now it's very much a stone wall farm, but he sees the value in hedges. He sees the value in splitting a large 10 hectare field. Um, so top of the right, put down a line, uh, got the digger in, mini digger in to uh, turn over the soil, makes it much easier for planting. As you can see, that's, that field is, is quite good, but it, it's much easier to plant um, having turned over the soil. Uh, just a reminder of when you're before you plant, if you're storing um, plants for long to heal them into the ground, top of the right picture, um, they, then they can stay for you know a month or so. Uh, and always keep them in the bag, not to let the roots dry out while you're planting. So again, um, planting six to the meter there uh, with a, a spade and slit planting, a second person is invaluable. 
and you fly along doing it. Um, the next thing then he, he did was identified the white thorn tree from hour one and put a, a marker on it, a marker so that it will never be cut. And number two, that the, the hares or rabbits might come along and, and cut the one, the one we don't want to cut, we're cutting the rest of them. And um, because again, I must go back to saying that Henry values a hedge with a really dense base and that's the option he's going for. He is going for the topped hedge, okay? Um, so we got the old silage plastic, he cut off the four foot strip off it, rolled it up, pushed it over the shoots, which he is in the middle picture there, has pruned them down to about an inch above the ground. And um, while we used to recommend putting gravel, I have now in recent years found it's very simple to push the sides of the plastic in, um, as you can see there in the bottom right hand picture, and um, it just sticks to the ground and uh, providing you just need to be careful for the first week that it doesn't uh, pull back over the plants, but that can be, that is very successful. The purpose of this then um, picture on the left there, so where the single stems have, uh, you, you saw the picture earlier of the one in, in Llanakilty, um, where it grew up and kept above the grass, so there was a good, good stem on it. In this case, then, instead of the one stem at an inch at, above ground level, there will be five. So this is where we have the growth, where we want it, and you can see then what happens. Um, and again, not to forget to protect from livestock. As little as possible from a livestock point of view if you're doing this type of hedge, because if um, the plan is that you'll be taking down the wire in five years, so a single strand electric, let the animals uh, gra graze under it, can be managed easier in future. Uh, it, it, it can be stock proof. Um, and just the picture there on the right is, is the rabbits and the hares. If you have a problem, some people get away without doing anything. Um, it can be very temporary. Uh, it's only for a few weeks, but whatever is needed um, needs to be done. Okay, so again, to go back to the principle of this type of a hedge then, um, so in, in year two then, Henry and anybody else that has planted a hedge, in year one, it was cut an inch above the ground. So again, there was five, there was more than five there, there was about seven. And in year two then, again, it shoots back up about two foot, but come back and cut it another inch above the previous cut. So now instead of five, we'll have 25. Do that in year three, you have just a mass of, of growth. It's not a race to the top. It's inch by inch by inch by inch. If you want the hedge like we have on the right, which is an absolute mass of growth and um, where the, 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 there is no need for a wire fence. So if uh, some uh, farmers particularly like this um, and, and that's good, but it, it only acceptable if it's the right height, a good height. And also you can see there it contains the trees um, both the, the mature trees, if uh, the, the big larger trees, but and in particular the, the thorn trees. Okay, um, so I suppose the purpose of this week, uh, I, I, I'm saying we're planting a seed so that we were the seed of inspiration that farmers will plant new native hedgerows um, and over the next year or few years. And uh, that's my message really for Hedgerow Week, why we plant and more than anything to inspire people to plant new native Irish hedges. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, you gave a good overview. So we are in the heart of hedgerow planting season now, really, aren't we? What, what is the... Um... It's actually a bit early. Now, again, it, it's down to each farm. Um, Henry there, a dairy farmer, just would have no time in spring to do it. Personally, if time allows, I would tend to go for the later the pos as, as possible because you have less time of it sitting in the ground. Um, now Henry will look after his, but you know, if, if you grow, if you plant it in February, you have only six weeks before it all takes off. So, but any time in the dormant season, you can plant. So Catherine, to talk about next week. So you have an exciting lineup of talks and articles coming up. How can people access this? Uh, because we, we, it, because of the COVID restrictions, obviously we can't have indoor events and so on. Yeah. So, so I think we to go year, for a slightly different format. Yeah, I think it's given us an opportunity, Mark. I would not have done what I, I've achieved if we had if I had been running around doing events. So I think we'll reach a different audience. We're going to have a stack of material on the website eventually. Um, so for after this, on every aspect of hedges. So this. Uh, each day we will deal with a topic 
The material will be released each day in all the normal um, media channels, print and social media, um, through Twitter, etc. People are far more aware of that than I am. So the, the uh, 30 um, topics are covered. So what I did was I went to the expert on that topic or an expert. Um, so for example, for I, I suppose I want to move on with all my habitat work to kind of saying that habitats are good for birds and bats and bees to saying which birds, which bats, which bees. So for example, on... Um, on, on, on hedges, Nile Hatch told us about the birds that live in the hedges, the specific ones. Um, same with the bees, Tina Offney from Bat Conservation Ireland talked about how bats use hedges and which the, the pipistrels that particularly use them. Um, the bees, Stephanie Maher from Trinity College talked about the, the bees and uh, she had a lovely example of, of the, she had, we were looking at a willow tree and she had the Andrina Clarkella, a lovely name of the solitary bee that lives only on willow. So, and then John Fien talked about the plants. So that's the biodiversity. The, um, the next day was the, the food. So um, Chef Paul Flynn from the tannery and um, a local cookery demonstrator, Rosemary Cusack, went foraging and came up with all the things you can do with it. Just amazing stuff for anybody with an interest in cooking or just, you know, it's, it's just a lovely childhood memory, I think, for any of us that have children to, to appreciate that side of, of the hedge. Mm -hmm. um, so on and on. Then we move on to the management, um, Mark. So this social media will be covered with Hedgerow Week. The, the hashtag is Hedgerow Week 2020. And if you go to the Chagas homepage, um, there's a, a, a link on the, the homepage there where that will be updated on a daily basis. I see you have some John Feehan there speaking on Monday. Uh, John is John is a, a, a really excellent uh, presenter. Is a great uh, view on on biodiversity. Um, uh, Stuart Green there on the, the mapping side of things. Yeah, it's a, you have a and you, you have farmers being interviewed as well. I see. Yes, yes. Henry, exactly, Henry yeah. Walsh and contractors, there. Mark. Right. We talked about contractors earlier. We have two fantastic yeah. um, people who cut hedges. They actually were the winners of our competition, our, our hedge cutting competition last year. So again, we went and uh, we talked to Tony Mullins, who cuts his, a farmer who cuts his own hedges and in Cork and Liam Hurley, a contractor in Limerick who was passionate about doing this and passionate about learning. Um, you know, he had already really, really um, taken on the, the, the height and the shape um, and uh, but had missed out on the, the new tree. So he's now passionately going to do that. So it's this is really, really important for, uh, and then Francis Quigley talks about what was the, the conversation that's needed between contractors and farmers. A lot of this is, is getting lost in the circle of the farmer thinking the contractor knows best, the contractor thinking they're doing what the farmer wants, and both thinking they're doing what the neighbours looking in want or think is a good, good edge. So it's very much to break the cycle. And I think that's where we need to engage with the non-farming community um, so that when I leave my hedge a little bit uh, less, less manicured, that I know they won't kind of think, God, they're... Mm. <laughs> They're, uh, yeah, they're lo losing the plot. Yes, yes, I understand. So, yeah, we have to lose our fascination with uh, uh, pre precision, I suppose, precision trimming and so on. Uh, Pat, some some interesting questions coming in there from from our audience. Um, if you want, to, if you like to, to go through, yeah, there's a, a, I suppose a couple of short ones. Uh, a great question: Any biodegradable alternative to silage plastic for covering ground on, on new hedges? I knew that would come. Um, yeah, I haven't found one, Pat, and I would love to. Um, so please help me if anybody has, has other ideas. We are using old silage plastic, so it's, um, you know, it, we're reusing. And uh, my 25 years experience is that we do not have a hedge with a dense space if we don't have plastic. So you have, you have one choice or the other at this stage. Uh, a question here just uh, about, or a, a maybe a caution about uh, the availability of, of supplies of hedging plants and uh, I suppose just saying not to leave it too long if you're looking for it because it mightn't be there. Yeah, good point, good point. And especially if you want to get um, the native provenance and the native species, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's a really important one for, na for next year, yeah. 
Uh, a question in relation to the dairy farm that you featured, is the motivation of the dairy farmer in the interest of biodiversity or is he uh, satisfying regulation or what's his, his, his motivation? No, definitely not for regulation, um, definitely motivation. And he has a lovely two minute video clip during the week on, on um, Thursday. So we, we'll see that. But no, it's not. It's, it's purely I think it's the, going back to the four reasons for doing anything for biodiversity. The, the law, I, I, you know, isn't for I don't particularly not for the planting. We have the schemes, not in this case. You know, some people will be getting money in future years, please God, for doing doing this. Um, but the, the marketing and the green image, I think a lot of our farmers ha are really understand that. And number four is the nice to do it. The feel good, the nature, family farms, passing on a farm in better condition now that they know what the condition that it is. So, yeah, no, I think they're the sort of farmers that are planting at the moment, Pat, the people who, you know, are inspired to do so. OK, a question here. Uh, challenging. Are Chagas leading by example? Absolutely. I've just finished um, going around our 12 or 13 farms and recorded all the amount that has been planted, but more importantly, the plans for the next four years. So and, and um, we have a lovely video clip from from Caroline O'Sullivan in, in Chagas Moor Park in Curtin's farm, where she documents what she has done and the plans for going forward. So kilometers going in on those farms, Pat, all our, our own farms. So we're, we definitely are leading by example at this stage. Okay, a uh, question here about in, in Kerry and Donegal, you will often see fuchsia hedges. Uh, what's your view on, on this species? Yeah, um, fuchsia, it's not a native one. Um, I suppose some of the coastal areas, maybe it's, it's come in there. Um, I look at where things are and it's not cause it, it, it tends to take over. I wouldn't plant it, I suppose, but then I, I maybe somebody from that area would have a different view. Um, but it's, you know, I, I, yeah, and it's certainly something I wouldn't spread to other places. You know, sometimes people see something and think, oh, that'd be nice. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, I wouldn't plant it normally on a farm. Okay, uh, a question there is, is Chagas engaging with contractors on the issue? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it, it, with, as I said, with the, during Hedgerow Week, we are, we always have done. I think the contractors are not the issue. I think the issue is the conversation and the general public kind of getting the contractors are being paid to do a job they will do what is needed but we all need to be yeah, a more education more general education more so do you know in the media we really need um the messages this week to go out that um because contractors will do what what farmers want that's right i see our colleague I suppose a question there uh, sorry sorry, sorry I, just, I see donald flanagan is just talking about uh, late planting their supply he said it's already selling out fast. Um, so, so, so not to leave it too late in the season, purely for okay. that reason. So even if we're not planting until, until February, get your stocks ordered now. That's a really good point, Donald. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So what I'll do is I'm going to just share the screen here, my screen with just some details where people can access uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the content for next week's Hedro, Hedro Week. Um, and I'll just uh, we can we can just talk. While yeah, that's, and, it, that's and it won't be up until each day. So just if people go in now, um, yeah. So it'll be added of as as we go through the week. So each day will be updated as as the week goes by. Sorry, Pat, I interrupted you there. No, no, you're fine. Keep going. Um, so um, the, did we talk about the toilet brush hedge? Um, <laughs> We, <laughs> and I love that uh, description. I think it's so... But the so, picture says it all, doesn't it? It does, there? it does. It does. Um, and I think, you see, I, I think we get confused because in summer, everything looks lovely. We've all got good hedges in summer. And then the stark reality, <laughs> if we're out in the fields looking at it this time of year, you know, um, yeah. So how do, how do you bring a, a hedge back from that... Uh, shape are you better off just to composite it right back and if if you want again it comes back to what do you want if you want it dense at the base you cut it at ground level and again we have a fantastic video from from Owen Donnelly doing that with the hedge um and in our, on our own farm in Planet Kilty as well but yeah cut it back at the base and you start again with a new hedge but it's far different than a sapling because now you have a huge root system under the ground 
if that's what you want. But I think the main thing is not to go back. Ha- what, what will definitely kill it or what is killing our hedges is where they're being hammered back to the same point every year. The hedges put huge en- energy into um, producing shoots and then you take them all away. Now, there's no harm in cutting a hedge. I like um, cut. I mean, I really like cutting hedges but cut in the right way, little and often. As I said, always remember that picture, that diagram, you come out a little bit, out, out, out. And the, the, um, the new hedges to follow on there, I think I talked about the second year and the third year, you're going back with your pruning. And then very, very soon, you won't be able to get anywhere in near that hedge. So the hedge cutter then um, trims it to a triangular shape. There's absolutely no excuse for new hedges or newly rejuvenated hedges why you don't get that perfect shape. Um, and let them grow up and up and up as far as the hedge uh, the contract the the hedge cutter will reach. If need be, then you come back with a circular saw and reshape if need be. But in general, you're letting them up and up and up. But definitely cutting each year or or you know every year or so um, to and every time you cut, you thicken it if it's done right. And that should also be good for carbon. We don't know the full story there yet, but you know dense dense growth sounds good for everything. Mm-hmm. That's one, just a, a question in there about the, the suitability of various plants in, in uh, heavy soil conditions. Uh, is there any variation in your, your advice? or? Uh, yeah, well, saying? I mean, I, the, the best guide is to look around down your own fields and see what's growing well at the moment. But if you're in any doubt, you know, the wetter soils, the alder, the birch, um, so there, but look, look at what's growing, growing well there. And uh, I suppose uh, a, a question there in relation to the management of uh, the hedgerows on banks at, at uh, ditches or at, at, uh, beside drains, any variation in the advice or? Um, for the sake of the drain, I wonder, or for the hedge? Um, not particularly. I mean, obviously, but this is the point. We really should never manage unless you're deciding why you're doing it. So you may be trying to leave shade for the water or you may be not, you know, water courses like some shade. They don't want all shade is is my understanding. So if you have hedges along water courses, you know, if you're thinking of the water course, you'd be having leaving some, you know, dense shade is good for the fish and some less dense shade. So a a variety, I suppose a variety is a very good word to remember when we come to uh, diversity, to come into biodiversity. We really want a mixture of everything on every farm of every type of management. And you can argue for anything, I suppose, is what I'm coming to Pat. So you, know, you can argue for doing any management. Um, th- there is always some good reason for doing it. Well, unless the very bad management, yeah. Which, and again, just to reiterate, the bad management for the top hedge is the short back and sides without leaving a tree. The, man- the bad management for the, the, the untopped hedge is to top it at three or four foot. That destroys, you know, it's neither a hedge nor a tree. Okay, Mark. Okay, well, and, uh, look, we're just on t- uh, time here. Um, we have had lots of questions coming through there. So thank you, everybody, for submitting your questions. Again, what I'm going to do is just show a, a screen here, share the screen with the details uh, for you to get gain access to all of the information about Hedgerow Week next week. Uh, but very simply, you can just go to the Chagas website and uh, there's a very clear link on the homepage there and it'll bring you to all of the uh, the various days uh, and don't forget sorry mark don't forget Stuart's presentation is part of our hedgerow week on this se- signpost seminar next friday Absolutely. Um, because mapping hedges is of huge interest to us and um, so Stuart is going to contribute to so absolutely, yeah. So we have Stuart Green joining us uh, for our webinar next Friday morning, and uh, he, he has some fantastic insights as to the, the digital mapping of, of hedgerows and, and maybe how we can get to a point where, particularly, I suppose, in the context of not just biodiversity, but uh, carbon sequestration, obviously, is a big uh, issue as well. Um, so, so mapping from that point of view is, is uh, very important. So Catherine, thank you so much for your presentation today and all of the work. Congratulations on, on the, 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 the fantastic schedule you've put together for next week and uh, really looking forward to, to, to seeing those, uh, those videos and, and uh, articles. Uh, and thanks to, I suppose, all, to, all the, the farmers and, and people who contributed to, to uh, the content as well. Um, and uh, also our thanks to Minister Pippa Hackett for joining us this morning. 
and uh, it's great to see uh, the interest there and great to see that we have a minister with specific responsibility for biodiversity. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for tuning in today. And as I said, I'm going to share the screen just with the, the details of how to access uh, the, the content for Hedgerow Week. Uh, so thanks again, Catherine. And Pat, thanks for uh, joining us and helping us with the questions. Thanks, everybody.